Greetings everyone, Nathan Nerdark here from Nerdarchy for Nerds by Nerds. We are doing some world building today, and with me I have Kanata. How's everybody doing tonight? It is 9pm on the eastern coast. I am freezing my face off, so I've got my jacket on and like three layers of clothes in my basement. But um, we are ready to start. Uh, today we're doing some uh, world building. I've got my little bits of stuff here. I'm using some home brewery, and that is a cool website online. You can like natural crit home brewery if you want to look it up. And basically lets it look all kind of clean and crisp and nice. I'm pretty sure I got the audio fixed. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. <laughs> a, bi a big movie producer. Oh, you enjoy the beard. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, normally when Nate and I have discussion about world building, things tend to get a little bit rowdy. And so <laughs> we, had, we had a talk back and forth and decided that we would try and stream it. Unfortunately, we're having a struggle with YouTube. I assume we're still fighting with YouTube. The struggle is real. I, it still says I'm thinking about loading and connecting. So sadly, anybody over on YouTube that was waiting for this, we're having some kind of conductivity issue. So yeah. David has gotten this to work previously, but you know, every time you try something for the first time on the internet, it's a colossal failure, <laughs> but we're over here on Twitch at least. Yeah, exactly. We have, we have one, we're here. We don't have Dave's magic touch with us. Yeah. So questions, lots of questions. And while you guys want to, if you guys have any world building questions or anything like that, if you guys want to throw those up in Twitch chat, since we can't get YouTube to work, if you want to throw those up here, we would love to address them. While you guys are doing that, I'm going to be berating uh, Nate with his most recent thing he wants to work on for the Chimes of Discordia setting uh, of Ganya. Uh, and that is yeah, a polar right. region around a planet. Yeah, so basically I remember I told you that we have two suns and they're mm. tiny. Let's just say they're like rifts to the positive elemental plane or something like that. So they're suns and just in like D&D &D cosmology. And then mm. they're on either side of this mega earth. So Alfganya is this giant place. And in Alfganya there is a multitude of different peoples and cultures. And the regions are basically hot on the poles rather than like our earth which is cold on the poles and then their equator rather than nice sunny beaches they have ice walls and uh, glacial chasms and other things like that so it's okay. and it's basically rather than you know you've got the the equatorial tropical zone this is uh, known as the you know frozen waste but it's also known as Kredgefer's belt and Kredgefer is basically a god in Ulfganya that is rangers survival kind of the gruffer bestial version of kind of like survival in the wilderness so it's like the the coal the the iron teeth in the night uh wolf rather than you know something more pleasant and nice and happy and okay. that describes the region just fine not pleasant not nice and not happy Okay, and you said that we we're going to be working on a very specific location tonight, right? A town. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. So basic ideas for a town size? Well, I figure it's going to be kind of everybody huddled together, even though this is going to be, uh, it's Warmston, and it's basically Warmstone is where the dwarves originally found it, the area is where they start it and it's a basic geothermal area in this frozen wasteland belt kind of like a was like an icelandic kind of feel to it it's got mm -hmm. you know there's snow and there's ice around but there is also this fresh melt and stone that's actually will melt the snow as soon as the snow comes upon it because of how warm it is and that is where the dwarves built their holds and their holds are actually above ground because okay so the dwarves are still there even now though yes the dwarves were the main founders of the town and they were going on an expedition to try and cross Kretcher's belt uh which is it's basically equivalent to in the 1700s saying i'm going to go to the north pole and stick a flag in it it's not easy at all it's very deadly I'm, 
I'm immediately thinking of dwarves in sailing ships now. Oh, and well, what a dwarven boat would look like. <laughs> well, it's all it's all kind of the southern seas and the northern seas don't interact really. So there's okay. no like melt okay. through, or maybe there could be, but in this area there isn't any melt through. Um, okay. Where there's actual seas connected together. Maybe deep underground, you you stick like a apparatus of quassel or whatever it's called together and you know do a, a submarine <laughs> adventure maybe you'll make it to there uh, that, uh, could, that could possibly work but as of right now it's just like a continuous belt uh that goes all over around the planet and orange orange wants to know if he can get you to turn up your mic a smidge you might be coming out a little quiet and let okay. me know how i sound too guys and in response to your question orange uh, what's the most challenging part of creating a D&D world or campaign? Convincing Nate that my idea is a good idea. <laughs> no, no, no. That's not... <laughs> How's the mic, by the way? It might be a little too loud now. My my throat's a bit off today. I've been sick off and on for two months, so I've got this like deeper voice than I normally have, and uh, I don't know how loud I have to be for it to get across to people. So Better. as far as, what was the question? What's the most challenging part of creating a D&D world campaign? Mm -hmm. uh, I would say just starting. It's just like a novel. It's just like any type of a creative endeavor. You know, you got to put, if you're going to draw something, you got to start with that rough sketch. You've got to, you know, once you get the idea somewhere, even if it's just like the inkling of a, a direction, oh, I want the form to be a certain way, just go with it. So that's what I would say. <laughs> <laughs> I think you got to comment on the sick voice. Nate doesn't always sound like this, but he has sick voice right now. Yes, I have sick, sick voice right now. Welcome to the early morning show with Nate. <laughs> How's Nerd it going today? <laughs> <laughs> How's it going? Yeah, so we talk about that in the live chats. The guys make fun of me because they're because <laughs> they know me. They know me for two decades plus, so they know what my voice usually sounds like. But hey, I'm I'm afraid if my voice was to change like this, I just have to figure out how to how to pitch it correctly and uh, the volume was. Yeah. <laughs> I, you have entered radio voice. Yes, radio voice. Welcome. Today we're going to have a fireside chat. <laughs> Twitch. Yeah. So about about crafting the world, it's just about just start with a spot. If you can't, if you're, if you're like, oh, I don't know if I want to have it be more like Dark Sun where the gods are away and it's more elemental. You know, so, or they're going to be like really in and they're going to have avatars on the world. It really depends, you know, if you can't get there on your idea and decision, then start with something small. Start with, hell, start with an NPC that you want to play. You want to play in the world as the DM and say, what's this guy about? Does he have some a particular type of faith? Does he have a particular type of mindset? Does he belong to an order? Does he has he is he you know just a guy going through the world or is he some important person in a, an important place? Maybe he's the mayor. Maybe he's the leader of the thieves guild. Start with that and then bam, well, you've got to answer questions and like questions beget more questions. And then eventually you've got the city where this guy who runs the Thieves Guild, like all the city. And then you start developing, well, the Thieves Guild's not run amok. So people have to constrain a Thieves Guild in some way. So there's some maybe some law people or there's some political powers that mm -hmm. all constrain the Thieves Guild ability to take over the town. And I'm if I if I seem distracted right now, I am trying to tell the people that we invited to come hang out with us on YouTube that they have to now come to Twitch. So I'm yeah. really sorry about that, guys. We just we're struggling just a little bit with getting the multi stream to work. I swear it just told me it was you press play and everything was going to be magic. That's how the okay. Internet works, right? <laughs> that's how yeah, technology exactly. works. When they say All press play, that's the only thing you have to do. It's like a magic pill. It just does what <laughs> it's supposed to do. Yeah. So I hope I answered your question. If you got if that further makes any questions for you, just uh, put them in the chat. Mm-hmm. So there we go. Mighty Hob is here. The Mighty Hob, <laughs> and we had bards in the basement, and I see you, Orange, and there's there's Lou. All right. <laughs> How's it going, guys? So for those of you just joining, what I have behind me is Home Brewery, and it's homebrewery.naturalcrit.com, and it's a great place to make kind of a pro looking type of form for you know spell lists for uh, new classes for new archetypes basically for for anything you really want to do i mean i could probably do a two-hour tutorial on showing you how cool homebrewery is but instead it's going to be like a show of what i particularly am using it for 
So you mm -hmm. can type in different, it's a little bit of HTML code and a little bit of just regular text. So anytime like a box is there, like the, uh, the note box, I say, let's build stuff in. Mm -hmm. So uh, for those of you who aren't super familiar with home brewery, please don't be intimidated with the concept. If you've never worked with like HTML or anything like that, don't be intimidated by that. You can literally look up command lists and the part of the screen that you're not getting to see right now, like right over my head here, you can see the kinds of things he's adding in on the other side. He has an interface screen right now where he's typing things in and adding little snippets of code and stuff like that and ending up with this nice looking product. But essentially it's a nice way to, uh, format any of the homebrew stuff you want to do. Now, I will say that this stuff isn't uh, open game license compliant. There's the, what is it, the SDROGL? What is it called? Yeah, you're not going to be able to take this and then make a product with it. You've got to do your own Precisely. thing. It's Precisely. It's great because it makes it look very nice, but you want to then set, set, set this and like make a PDF. You want to PDFify this and then mm -hmm. make a a hundred page product using home brewery. Yeah. From my understanding of the legal stuff. But again, I'm not a lawyer. Canada, are you not a are you a lawyer? No, I am not a lawyer. I just I'm... RP as the legal department for nerd yeah, RP. <laughs> <laughs> and let's just say it's my worst. It's not my strongest character RP. So um yeah. So don't 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 trust me when it comes to law stuff. But it's what what it I do yourself. know is some of the stuff that's posted for home brewery. One of the things that the creator talks about is that uh, like uh, the fonts aren't his, the little like snippets of uh, visual elements that have been included in this aren't his. So if you're going to use it, you're basically going to be able to make yourself a really gorgeous looking handout to give to your players and it starts out digital. So if they want to print it out, they can print it out. If they don't want to print it out, they have this gorgeous digital PDF. It's especially useful if you have an insanely wordy amount of stuff. Like I made a classless system for 5e where you just pick abilities. That is a massive amount of text. How many, it's like 28 pages or something. Oh, what is? The classless system I wrote. I don't remember how big it is. It's significant. And you haven't even transferred in, into pretty prettifying it. Yeah, and it's not even pretty, but if I want people to read it, making it pretty is gonna make that a lot more likely. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. the so, frozen belt of the wastes. That's where we are. Yeah, it's not, not the best, but it gives you an idea. This is basically like someone has said this at some point. Okay, all right. So, Credifer, am I saying that correctly? Yeah, it's Credfers. And, Credfer. Um, yeah, it was basically someone from our old campaign, Pete, uh, when we were way back in the day, I guess like 15 years plus. He basically made up a deity. And he said, I'm going to make it up with these D20 rolls. So he rolled a whole bunch of D20s and he came up with Tred Kredgefer. He came mm. up with all of those letters and then smashed them around until he got a name. <laughs> and it has stuck for 15 plus years. So I'm just continuing to use it. Because it's the perfect, I, it's the perfect deity who he just happens to be named Kredgefer. Can I use it in Scrabble? No, probably not. Um, no. Okay, so we have we have. Can I just call it Kredgefer? Is Kredgefer fine? Kredgefer is fine. Is Kredgefer, saying Kredgefer's okay. belt every time? Yeah. You could say so, the belt. Or the belt. The, the belt's expanse, even better. So that's I like that. We can call like it the that belt. Better. Okay, so we have the belt, right? And the belt is crazy frozen area. And we have a dwarven settlement here. And when I think of dwarves, I think of a lot of stereotypes, like hopefully they're going after some kind of mineral or resource, or maybe they are. Because remember, I know as little as you guys, in fact, some of you guys who have been with Nerdarchy for a longer for, for a long time might actually know more about this setting than I do. Um, so we have to assume there's some reason why these guys came here. The dwarves yes. pitch tents for fun. <laughs> like, I like, I, like I said, I mentioned it. Um, they were doing an expedition across Kretschfer's Belt. They wanted to um, basically go past uh, to the other side. So they're in the south uh -huh. and they want to go north. So was this just expeditionary then? Like, this was like ex originally expeditionary with the idea that they were going to establish a trade route once they could control an area. But it just turned out to be such a devastatingly hostile place 
that they mm -hmm. said, you know what, um, you know, we're dwarves and we're stubborn, but we like, like living is good. <laughs> they, <laughs> that first, they basically the first, they, they wanted to make it through in a year and they set up the schedule to make it through in a year. But you know, when you're traveling and when you're exploring, stuff comes up. So what happened yeah. is as they go through the, the belt, uh, they get about two thirds of the way, like a lot halfway through and they find this really nice place after having a lot of people die a lot of people have problems a lot of monsters that they've never heard of or seen before kill people so all this stuff oh yeah <laughs> all this stuff happens. Yes, and they good. yes and they've got this place they call warmston this warm stone that they found the warm rock area and they okay. set up it was kind of base it was basically one of those wow we, we can, you know the gods have been good to us we can live we can make it okay all right. Okay. So they found a, essentially like a hot spring kind of situation here. So they're, yes, so they're, yeah. so they're, they're going to be able to survive here. And so I have immediate questions that require answers first. What's their access to, to the like shoreline? Are they so far in that they're no longer have like port access to the waters? Or because if they have port access, then we can explain tons of stuff like where food's coming from, how they're getting oh, close. Okay. Yeah, they do not have port access in the in the in the normal traditional sense of there's a sea, mm. there's water, it's lapping. There's against the the you know against the the island or whatever or the land. Right. It's not like that. They have a frozen sea, where it's mm. just a like glass smooth frozen area. It's very large. There's liquid water underneath, so you can go ice fishing and things like that. But, so there is things that you can ice fish on, but there's hostiles there. There's hobgoblins who uh, sail around on giant- Are they snow white like winter wolves? Let them be snow white. Can we note that? They should be snow white like winter wolves. Hob snow white hobgoblins? Yes, come on, that's amazing. All right, so oh. we're gonna set up a section and we're gonna say, those are going to be um, uh, dangers. <laughs> danger, danger, danger. Uh, orange. And monsters. I, think, I think the belt is so cold because magic. Um, oh, the well, uh, you can say magic, <laughs> but I say because there's two little suns. The, it's a giant. It's a spectacularly large planet, and the suns are at the the poles, and just kind of the the planet rocks back and forth in this really wobbly bit there oh in in you uh, you had mentioned something sometime in the past you were talking about like tidal locked planets yeah. so they, are we saying it's, that it's got a bit of a wobble to it but it is not significant enough to ever melt Kredgefer's belt okay so we're we're i it sounds like the theory we're going to go with for this is because magic with some science in it a little a little <laughs> bit of science at the north and south poles there's an endless sun desert which we can go into some at the time, but it's like the, the the polar opposite of this conversation. So oh, the <laughs> polar dad jokes coming out already. Yeah, I am um, father of, of many, so you know they've got to come out every once in a while. So we've really? got hobgoblins. You're saying make them winter wolf color? Yeah, we could do winter wolf colors. If we did winter wolf colors, are like husky colors. Oh, ho, ho. has anyone ever seen a husky with blue eyes? I, I what if I the hobgoblins? What if the hobgoblins are like the winter wolf colors with the deep blue eyes? Oh, sure, God. Ice blue. There we go. Yeah. Ice blue. And it kind of makes sense. I don't I don't know. Most of the pictures, a lot of the pictures and images of hobgoblins that I've seen, hobgoblins tend to have a very, very short coat of fur. Yeah, uh, they're, they're really well eyes. grimmed. It's, it's almost as if, like, they've got... I don't know. You say five o'clock shadow, like one week shadow all over their body. Mm -hmm. Like, so like a beard's grow, like a week or two worth of beard grow all over their body. They seem really, See, even their hair I, is, is military style. <laughs> you know, like. I, I think that's brilliant. I think that's right. And you were talking about, you have this giant, uh, like a glaciated area, not an actual glacier, but just a, a massive area of a, essentially a perpetually frozen sea or or yes, uh, it's perpetually shoreline. frozen there is there is water underneath so there mm -hmm. is a there are, there are creatures like fish you can go fishing there and there's also 
uh, terrible monsters that try. To yeah, I, I was going to say, and it's D&D, so there's also something under the water that you never want to see that will kill you. Which is why the hobgoblins go around and traverse the sea. First, first off, it's easy on, on sleds. So they, it's basically mm -hmm. like sailing ships with these giant sled rudders. Oh, God. See, that's like really barge, cool. Like bar giant barge sleds. Giant barge sleds. Yeah. Okay. Nope. I'm totally into this. This works. This works. All right. Yeah. So giant barge sleds. No, wait, yeah. wait, wait, wait. What is pulling them? Or are we doing, like, I don't know if any of you have ever played like Dark Sun or something. In Dark Sun, they had silt skiffs. So they essentially had uh, like, like a sailing ship that had pontoons that would sail across the silt. Yeah. Are we are we using a sailboat build to make this work? Yeah, I think we're doing that. Oh, I like that. We could also do it where they have um like be no, like the normal sled that would have beasts or something in front of it, but I like I like the <laughs> nautical theme of of this sled. Yeah, well, you could do both. I don't see why you couldn't yeah. do both and then some form we need ideas for some form of insane, like Greek era ore ship. Like that, that somehow it's people powered. Like that would be amazing to have a ship where there are people inside it somehow propelling it along the ice. Oh, like, like spine, like spined oars, like oar hooks or something. Yeah, like oar hooks or something like that. Always be where. With the tidal lock, though, the poles will be incredibly hot. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, the Mighty Hob, I think that is the direct. I don't know. You're going to have to verify, Nate. We I don't talk about the poles because I don't think, I don't know if there's anything there. Uh, <laughs> uh, perhaps she, later. There's something in Crutchford's belt. So there could very well be something in the, the deserts of Endless Sun. Uh, Tremere with oar hooks. Hob, just stay in chat. I'm going to need you all night long, dude. Tremere, <laughs> Tremere? <laughs> Tremere with oar hooks. This is that is exactly Trem what that's Tremere, where my right? Yes. So, yeah. oar hooks. I'll make a note. Just just a note. I have a feeling there'll be a bunch of notes we make, yeah. and then tons of things get thrown away. Uh, but that's, that's but the nice thing about this. You can make really good delineation. So you know, I've got dangers and monsters. I've got hobgoblins kind of a little bit of description of them and then later I can flesh that all out. So made a note about ore hooks and mm. absolutely orange, a living dead. Like that's exactly what I'm thinking. I mean, if we've got this huge city here, I don't see any reason not to fully explore all the nautical themes uh, like, and just throw those ideas out there. Like an undead ghost ship on the massive icy plains is is right up the alley. Uh, hobgoblin pirates, dwarven pirates, come on! <laughs> well, like, the, the hobgoblins try and control. They're almost they're like what would be equivalent to like a pirate empire. Mm. They try and they try and own the 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 ice seas. Oh, Hob's they, still killing it. He said the the ship would have giant steerable blades underneath. Oh, that's a great idea, dude. <laughs> yeah, this was a good choice. I taught sharing is caring. I knew this was Blade a good steering. Choice. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yes, so, you are the winner, sir. <laughs> recently, I played this Warmston area in uh, what was it called? The the thing. The, the thing with person the who stole Father's Winter's Day. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Ryan had made one a while a while back, and it was kind of a you know tribute to the Grinch who stole Christmas. Mm -hmm. And I liked his concept, but I had some ideas that I wanted to kind of work out. So I took that concept and made and moved it to another town that I wanted to mess around with. So it's mm -hmm. almost as if like the 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 sister city, the sister town to the original town that, that Father's Winter's Day originated in. So they've both got their different traditions and different styles mm. of doing things. Because I wanted to change it up without just simply reading the module and, and doing the adventure again. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so one of the things I added was this this terrible um, centipede-like, well, I haven't decided how it looks because they've only seen its spines that it shoves through the ice to attack people. Wow. 
I saw I saw a discussion. Uh, you guys talked about the spines coming up from uh, coming up underneath the ice. It has a tremor sense. Yes. Is that what it was? Yeah. Yeah. Things that live under the ice in the cold black ocean with tremor sense. List of things you don't want to run into. Number one is that check <laughs> and the great the great thing was during that game they were just waiting for something bad and then when the hobgoblins <laughs> passed they got they escaped the hobgoblins they kind of hid on the island and waited for them to go by on their patrol and they're like okay we've worked it out we can get 10 minutes run to that next island hill that's going to block their line of sight and we'll be golden and we'll just make it to the other side of the sea so they're hoofing it and then they mm -hmm. go across this patch of ice that's not clear. You can't see in, you can't see down more than oh, like half a foot because it's all cracked and crystalline ice. So it, it doesn't give you a nice mirror or glass look at the, at, the, at the sea below. So that's where the thing's hiding. So as soon as they run of over one of those, it it's like boom, boom, smashing through it. And I had, a, I had two of them attack. And they really did a great job of not breaking the ice while still attacking it. Because the terrible thing is, <laughs> well, that's the thing, right? It's I imagine I'd be pretty focused on not breaking the ice while I was swimming <laughs> at it. I, I don't want to swim with it. I... Yeah, that thing will eat you if you swim with it. Yeah. So it's got these spines that shoot through and try and, and wound you to the point that it can just break through and eat you. Or break enough pieces that you fall through. So mm. that's one of the, the terrible things about it. And they did really well attacking it indirectly. So I have to mm -hmm. say that there is definitely going to be some, some parties that are going to have a bigger problem with it <laughs> because they don't have these spells or these powers. I hit it with my axe. Are you sure about that? Yeah. Never mind. Go ahead and roll the hit. Yeah. Okay, well, you broke the ice, and now you can hit it. Now your next attack can hit it. Yeah, so they used uh, Spirit Guardians, which actually really just tore those things up. Okay, because... here's... Here's a good question. Here's a good question. This is something I was going to end up asking you anyway. Okay. Uh, uh, Russet Man uh, asked, uh, what special sorts of resources would you have there? Ice that doesn't melt or melts very slowly is the first thing that comes to mind. So some, some form of interesting thing. I actually, as we've been talking about this, I've been formulating trees in my brain, like weird trees that would actually grow in the icy wastes. Um, we can get but is there trees. anything... Is there anything that's already there, like pre-existing stuff? All right. So what I've got planned so far, we've got called it's called the ghost pine trees, and it's mm. ghost pine because it's this really nice light colored wood, and they you can harvest the sap from it. You can eat. You can make stew and teas out of the needles, and uh, you can also make wooden objects and and use it for firewood. Have you ever watched Bear Grylls? Bear Grylls? No. Bear Grylls. And he does the survival videos and he takes like, he's out in the way. Have any of you ever watched Bear Grylls in the survival videos where he takes like the cup and he puts pine needles in it and he talks all about the vitamin C and every time you end glass. Yes, the vitamin C. I don't, think you, I don't think you know this yet, but I've eaten pine needles before and pine tree. Oh, yeah. oh, and pine I sap. That must have been stringent. Uh, you know what? It's not bad. <laughs> oh, God. It's I, delicious. I'm into the whole, you know, finding stuff in the wilderness, wild foraging stuff. So I have, that's what inspired me to kind of include these strange foods. Mm. And, mm -hmm. and if it was your choice between dying or having carbohydrates and foods, you're going to, you're going to go for that pine tree. You're going to be yeah. munching on trees. Yeah. That's why, as, you know, some older, older uh, people watching here, I mean, like longer watching viewers. Uh, they would know They're that Dave every once in a while munchins that I take my kids out to munch on some trees. <clears throat> wow. Delicious kids. Today we're going to eat oak leaves. Don't swallow it. <laughs> hey, you know, you know what? My my son, Xavier, he will go and while he's waiting for the bus stop at our house, pick up onion grass and eat it. Just hanging out, eating some there onion are, grass. There are a few kinds of grasses if I'm out on a hike. I live in Montana. Those of you who uh, have been my viewers before – already know but i live in montana and when i every once in a while when i go out for a hike they're like grains and grasses and the fresh shoots if you pull them out uh like slip the shoot out of the ground there will actually be this like rubbery end on it that's super soft and super sweet it's delicious so 
if you're hiking and you want a snack there you go <laughs> yeah so the ghost pines can be used their their sap can be used to make brews and mm. other things like it's basically like pine it can be made to to be like pine tar so it's basically all the things you want to bind stuff together you want to waterproof something flammable oh if you do some alchemical processes to it it will be flammable Tur no, really turpentine is basically yeah exactly yeah exactly no that sounds good that sounds good so they use it for okay. sap fuel you know fuel food we have we have frozen we have giant frozen ice wastes we have the huge glassy frozen ice sea. We have a scary, crazy, creepy thing that lives under the water that we don't know anything about. Oh, my head's in the way of it. I think that's the right way. That might not be the right way. Is that the right? I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> Are you blocking stuff? Oh, I need to I'm move down. Stuff. Yeah. Somehow. <laughs> <laughs> I think if you, you should be able to scroll the web page and OBS should pick up your movement. All right. We'll try that. It'll be fine. How's that? Did that work? Right. No, did nothing. No, I have no idea. We have a, there's stream delay. There's like 15 seconds. I won't know. In 15 seconds, I'll tell you what it looked like. <laughs> it, it worked on my end. <laughs> I'm oh, yeah. asking no, you it, and you're not going to know. Yeah. <clears throat> so I another, really another, another food source is stone bread, which is actually a mushroom that grows in the ghost pine forest. Mm, and I like it this. looks like basically loaves carved from stone, which means, you know, heart for the dwarves. Like <laughs> they're going to, they're going to totally <laughs> dig that. So they love that stuff. Meat off the bone. Yeah. Yeah. All right. It's like we've always wanted to literally eat rocks, and this is as close as we're going to get. Dried stone bread. Okay. Okay. So the dwarves live there, but we have to assume that we're going to – are you doing like a primarily dwarven inhabitants take this place up, or – is this because it's kind of a, I imagine it's difficult to get inland. You'd have to get dropped off by a seafaring vessel, get on an ice faring vessel, take the long trip across the frozen uh, sea to get to the village. Mm -hmm. And then once you get to the village, I mean, that's, that's a fairly large journey. So what kind of population are we talking about here? And, and how, how many different peoples live here? All right, that'll be residents. So we've got residents here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the residents are mostly dwarves. Most the dwarves are mostly what comprise the original mission. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so if you can imagine, rather than humans being what you normally see be the majority in a city, it's going to be dwarves as the majority in the city. This with, makes sense. With humans coming in second, and then basically all the other races are coming in after that considered like uncommon in that area okay the dwarves because i'm i'm a huge fan of dwarves uh the dwarves are the dwarves because normally what happens with well i shouldn't say normally because everybody makes different settings uh in classic examples of dwarven culture and chat you're welcome to disagree with me on this in classic examples of dwarven culture you end up with uh, different families of dwarves. So you'd have like the gray beards and the iron beards and the blood drinkers and the bone breakers and, you know, the different groups of dwarves. Is it specific families that have survived from that initial mission? And so those families control the city or is it, is it all like, one, or I shouldn't say family clans, or is it just one huge clan of dwarves? Uh, it's, it's a bit of a mix, I'd think. Mm. It's going to be where there's, there's, let's say there's three to five major families within the clan, but they've all kind of, over the hundreds of years that they've been there, they've all kind of banded together in against the wilds. So this is, this okay. is kind of like when there's an alien invasion, we're all, we're all humans, not aliens. So okay. Okay. this is, this so is the fight against the wilderness. So basically we're, it's like, we're all dwarves here, even the humans. You guys count. <laughs> you guys can count as honorary dwarves well, until we're done killing the hobgoblins. <laughs> well, yeah, I would say I would say the dwarves, uh, the humans in the area, they wouldn't have come up in large enough numbers to impact the culture as much as dwarves. So it's like the dwarves are informing everybody else how the town is, rather than okay. humans and their particular line of culture kind of setting the stage. So I would say that the dwarves set the stage for how the culture goes. So when humans show up, they usually act, they usually join a family. 
in mm. one of either through business partnering, through I'm going to work for you as a as a as a worker, so I'm basically under your protection. Ah, in, in okay. that sense, right. so basically everybody because everybody would know everybody in that situation because of the small amount of people there, it would yeah. be a tight knit community. You'd have your you'd have a lot of outsiders because I mean pretty much everyone's decided yeah. to go to the north for some reason. Yeah, exactly. Why are all of you here? It doesn't. <laughs> we like it here. <laughs> every once in a while, a person comes south. Sorry, sorry to cut you off. No, no. So every once in a while, someone comes from the south, which is a bit further of a journey. But you mm. know, they see the they get lost or whatever, or they they're trying to make it across, and they see the the smoke and the the heat coming emanating from the area, and they're like, "Oh, I want a part of this." And then it's really hard. It's really hard to leave. You've got to be really determined, more determined than these dwarves were. To keep going on after you get to Warmston. It's uh, uh, the mighty Hob said uh, another sn another food snow jellies, jellyfish that freeze their bodies in the ice, and tentacles. Oh, so you mean like oh. like a jellyfish who would literally like embed itself in the ice and leave its little danglies out there to catch food? That's, That's not cool. a terrible idea. That's yeah. a cool idea. And if they if they oh, wait clams shellfish extend these little tendrils uh when they attach themselves to, like stones and stuff in the ocean uh that it, so they can essentially anchor themselves against any currents or tides and because jellyfish are such weak weak uh swimmers what if that's what they do maybe the jellyfish use some of their tendrils to attach and then like there are dwarves that know there will be, oh, this is good ice. There'll definitely be jellies down there. Let's get some. And they start digging and pulling out these huge, uh, you know, ice encrusted jellyfish. Oh, the soup will be good today. <laughs> <laughs> and they make, they make jelly out of the jellyfish. Mm. Oh, okay. And I like this too. Russet man said this, uh, if you're doing something with elementals, having ice-based elementals would be cool. Uh, you could have them be like a, a miniature blizzard. <laughs> now, <laughs> now that you use the word miniature, all I can think of is little adorable ice elementals and nothing scary. I'm colder than the frozen waste. Uh, we're not going to be friends. <laughs> just me. You know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you're colder than this already is, we're not going to be friends. <laughs> No, I, I like this idea, though. Little Like, ice elementals is not a terrible idea. And it, the more you start to flesh out the ice belt, the I think the more play ice elementals would get, as well as other elements, like the the boats. I mean, the more, it, the more area those boats cover, the more people that they come under use by, and the greater, you know, the more stuff you get to see as far as, like, you know, I really like the pirate ship idea. I immediately went off on a pirate tangent. And I'm like, <laughs> and we could do a Davy Jones locker thing, but in the ice wastes. <laughs> but in the ice wastes. <laughs> oh, that would be quite an adventure. You're 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 mining into the ice to mm. hunt for sunken ships. Exactly. That'd be that, crazy. <laughs> this makes this brings up even more. There are so many questions. I have so many questions. All right. We don't have enough time. Well, okay. You, think about your questions. We're going to go into okay. finish off the residents. So okay. Finish mostly off mostly dwarves, a right. bit of humans, and the rest of the races are uncommon. Uh, but everybody, okay. everybody can be there because basically anybody that wants to travel to that region, why did you get there? Or if you're just dumped, oh, it's traveling the plains and. I'm a, a water genasi or whatever, and I just got dumped into this area. It's kind of nice. I think I'll stay. And that mm. I don't know how to get back home. So, <laughs> what are the what are what are the uh, uh, biases or the uh, opinions uh, culturally? Uh, like, do the dwarves control because they controlled the town originally? They probably still control the bulk of the wealth. Yes, they uh, would. Uh, because they control the bulk of the wealth, uh, one of the things you see with wealth control, especially in, in in more ancient eras, was things like guilds forming, where you couldn't be a blacksmith unless you were part of the blacksmiths guild. Mm -hmm. uh, do, are there are, are there any like political features going on in a town like that, or is it like is it just too small a town for that much? I think it's too small a town to get into that kind of stuff. But there is a big deal. I would say the the biggest deal is. Uh, whether ha there's like the lumberjacking industry and that's one of their mm -hmm. exports is the ghost pine. Yes. So it's, that is a major driver of the forest. It's kind of weird. 
the dwarves are really obsessed with that ghost pine forest range. So anything that threatens or messes around with that is like on the bad list, right? Like immediately. So anybody that comes in saying, oh, you know, I'd like to stake claim someplace and it happens to be either, if it's, if it's gonna undermine the revenue of the town by messing with mm -hmm. the ghost pine, they're really not digging it unless you compensate them properly. So you burn down a section mm. of that, you are on the bad list forever. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, you've burned down some of our trees. You, you can burn down the inn as long as you, <laughs> as long as you don't burn down a giant section of the ghost pine forest. So, so is this one of those, oh my God. So this makes me think that at some point in this area, is anybody else thinking this? Dwarven Rangers? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Okay, because that the the concept of a dwarven ranger who who you know he reports back to his dwindle and Godfrey or whatever their names are and and dwindle reports back to Godfrey and says, well, I I've seen four people out in the woods today and one of them started to cut down our, our pines, but they're huge and they have big weapons, so I came back for help and you know that what I mean. That could easily be a hook, yeah, for the town. Oh God, yeah. Okay, <laughs> now. Uh, what is what are some of the other stuff? Mm. So you've got the hobgoblins to deal with. They tend to stand, stay on the seas because that's where their power is. They have, uh, like, their, their, their power is in their ability to basically be cavalry all the time. Mm -hmm. They have high military efficiency, high, high motive force because of the sleds. Right. So they've, they, they have a, a large territory, but it's mostly ice. Ice, ice <laughs> like sea. It's mostly frozen sea. So and, it's like they're like Vikings with okay. less farmland. With less farmland. The Vikings spread out because they didn't have enough farmland. So Yes. <laughs> so they're they're they have even less. <laughs> uh so uh Babakis had another another consideration, and I like the direction you're going in this, dude. Uh there might be nomadic humans in the area and the dwarves are settlers who came later, which really just brings up the question, like a natural question to address. Were there people here before the dwarves showed up? Was there anyone living here in any fashion before the dwarves arrived and settled? At that particular time, there wasn't anybody settled at Warmstone, that area. Mm -hmm. But I can see that being a place that people would stop maybe in the coldest parts of the month. So yeah. there'd be probably small nomadic tribes that hang out in the area kind of like grow the town in the winter you know kind yeah. of like huddling together for warmth kind of feel to it i like this idea i like the idea of the nomadic tribe saying look you know every time every year at fall we pack up we come over here and this is our hunting ground this is where we stay so the dwarves have a good relationship with these tribal people like the tribal people show up and say hey we're we're it's cold again and we're back again and we're going to hang out here because this is where we always go um, or, or is there possibly because it's more exciting for players <laughs> and, and crazier for the, is there strife between the dwarves and the nomadic people? I mean, because dwarves typically are not good at sharing. <laughs> it's, like, that, you know? it's their, their susceptibility to dragon sickness, I guess. I am going blind. I got something <laughs> in my eyeball. Um, as long as you can still talk, we can still roll. Saunas be part of the, yeah. Would saunas be part of the culture there? Oh, that sounds that, great. Yeah, that's one of those nice little elements you could throw in as the GM discussing things like a traditional Japanese bathhouse kind of thing or uh, old old school Roman bathhouse, that kind of thing where you're like, I, I find the idea of a dwarven sauna intriguing and mildly disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen so much hair. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> they've got um, special brushes at the door <laughs> that you you yeah. take off two handed. I I <laughs> I think I and Bob Kiss, I'm right behind you, dude. I think that's exactly right. Uh, Rangers being like partially responsible for maintaining relationships between the dwarves and the tribal people, like going back and forth and trying to keep things amiable so everybody can get along. Yeah, I would say uh, the dwarves are going to be interested in keeping what's theirs. But yes. they would have probably, they might have even discovered it by the nomads, by seeing nomadic tribes moving towards Wormston. And then when the mm -hmm. nomadic tribes were like, hey, this has been great. Welcome to the area. 
uh good luck surviving we're gonna go off now because it's like spring <laughs> there. yeah it's spring it's time to go hunting um and which which doesn't which is kind of they've kind of have like two seasons they have really stinking cold freezing everything <laughs> and not so stinking cold nice still That's, freezing I... still freezing but not as terrible bitter nastiness I'm ready to move in. I, <laughs> so, it's more like they've got their 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 fall, and then winter, and that's all they've got up there. So when it, when it's when it becomes fall again, they're gonna go off. The nomadic tribes go off, and the dwarves are like, "Well, we don't do this nomadic tribe stuff. Let's build a hold. Let's build, you know, a great hall. Let's do all that kind of stuff." So yeah. they're I, I would say probably they're gonna be hill dwarves, I think for the mm -hmm. most part, because they're gonna they're gonna be building. You know, for for also their interest in not like crafting areas into the Warmston area. Yeah. So I mean, they've crafted their vents for getting heat to the area, but they're gonna they're mostly gonna be like the ghost pine forests, crafted log houses, just with really burned up. So they're they're almost underground. They're like a hybrid hobbit house, <laughs> rather than rather than the mountain dwarves, which are oh. gonna be like deep deep in the mountains. There was there was a uh, tribal community that built uh, homes that were mildly similar to Hobbit homes, where they would essentially dig into hillsides and things like that and build homes. I can't remember the name of them right now. Penguin Arrow. <laughs> <laughs> that they can't fly, but they can swim like crazy. <laughs> Dude, the messed up thing about that idea is that it's kind of brilliant. <laughs> I like it a lot. It's absolutely mental, but it is kind of fun. Oh, we're back. I think we're good. Yeah, I got it's disconnected, back. but we're back on. Everything Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Sorry about that. The internet exploded. We've had all kinds of internet issues tonight. Sorry about that. But it's working. It's working. We're live. Everything's okay. Yeah, so... Penguin Eric Crocra. Yeah, We're Penguin writing those down as a possibility because yeah. that's sensational. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and I, I think, I don't know who it was, but I like the Icebreaker Orcs. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Icebreaker Orcs. I don't uh, know who that I, was. I didn't even get to get to those yet. Yeah, we were, so, we were so to... busy and everything. I like the Icebreaker Orcs. Yes, Icebreaker Orcs are good. Uh, and giant Icebreaker Orc Fortresses. Are amazing regional bears yeah I, I, orange that's the kind of thing <laughs> hob icebreaker orcs are mine okay <laughs> I, yes, I thank you the mighty hob that sounds like a cool idea i think the idea of getting into regional creatures that exist in the area we i think we should definitely touch on more than just this is the scary stuff also touch on this is the kind of thing that lives here you know well, I think we can go with anything that's considered like an ice desert in our normal world and say those are there. So like bears, rabbits, foxes. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Mine. My precious. <laughs> <laughs> so there's there's bears, rabbits. The ice kraken. I keep I keep getting derailed, Hob. I'm supposed to be paying attention to chat. I keep getting derailed and then I'm like talking. <laughs> to Nate and super focused in on crazy ideas. Yeah. Fire away. If, if you had a, an idea about an ice crack and hit me again. Yeah. I like, I like that can be put in there as well. Ice cracking. I mean, ultimately this band, it goes around the entire planet, right? Yeah. Okay. Like so the, 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 the concept of this belt of ice around the planet, all inclusive ideas like tribal penguin Aarakocra and ice krakens and whatever the crazy spined tremor sense thing under the ice is those ideas could carry across all the way around this band so some of these ideas are much much larger in scale than just the village um it's just this area this area is not very fleshed out we're working on it right now yes yeah, so this is an example of world building from the tiny and then with with a big in mind but not not doing the the whole totality of it at once yeah. So the micro, the micro, and the macro. Yeah. Uh, ice boring tentacles. They reach up through the ice and pull prey through the hole they make. 
That is nightmare fuel, sir. TPK. <laughs> That's TPK <laughs> fuel. <laughs> total total party kill. Everyone is dead. Congratulations. You won, GM. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, big things in cold areas. I kind of like the idea of some form of ice dwelling creature that a beast of burden uh, mm. that would generate body heat. Okay. But the problem with something like that is what does it eat? Ghost pines. It eats ghost pines? I the say make it thing... her herbivores. Herbivores, whatever. Herbivore? A herbivore? A herbivore. <laughs> Nailed it. Uh, I think the only herbivore I can think of that ate pines, because pines are incredibly unnutritious as far as herbivore diets go, which is why you don't hear about a, lo a lot of herbivores surviving off of pine trees. They just um, are, they're picky and they like to eat this, the other stuff first. They never have to make it to pine trees because they can eat grass. Herbiverse. Uh, considering that frost giants are a thing. Oh yeah, frost giants are a thing. I just, I just imagine something, if it's gonna eat frost pines, it has to be as far as activity level, if we want to play with a little bit of science and our little bit of magic, it should be the kind of creature that's able to survive with a low quality fuel. So like a koala bear lives off of low quality fuel. A uh -huh. It just eats bear, a lot. Right. It consumes a lot. It spends the bulk of its time sleeping uh, while it's trying to digest these super low quality fuels. So what kind of like big massive creature that we can use to drag around stone and ores and trade goods and stuff? What's where's that? What's that extinct? Mm, it's like the the ancestor of a cow or something like that. Aurex or something like that. Aurox. 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 I don't see any reason. They've got not the to. horns, and they've got you know they can have like a really big. They're kind of like sheep cows with horns. Sheep sheep cows with horns. You you heard it here first. <laughs> Completely original creature. Sheep cow with horns. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Or rocks. I gotta Google it. I gotta go. He's gonna keep yeah, typing. I think it's Google. spelled spelled like that. A U R O C H. I think. C. Also known as sheep cow with horns. It looks like Five E might actually have stats for or rocks. Oh really? Uh, because when I typed into Google, the first thing came up was or rocks Five E. <laughs> I was like, Man. what? Really? You know what I need. Yes, yes, the Mighty Hobbs, an ancient breed of cattle. I just didn't remember if it was the wild cattle before people tamed them or what. Oh, like, no, this is kind of totally like bison. Uh, no, there's totally stats for them. It looks like Pathfinder had stats for them and 5e right. has stats for them. Well, get it from the MM. <laughs> it's and, already yeah. done. And there are sick, hot pictures of them. Okay, I have to go look. I'm going to check just the base monster manual. I, I know I could be using a PDF, but I really like paper things uh, because I like to touch them. So, ink eggs. We haven't even talked about ink eggs. Oh, Remoraz. It's got to be some Remorazes. They fought Rem some of them in the, in, the, in the show that I did. So, <laughs> absolutely have got some Remorazes. Okay, either way, I have some super wicked awesome pictures of the Aurochs, and they're absolutely gorgeous. It could be that dwarves are just heavily dependent on trade and are importing the grain that the Aurochs eat. Yeah, I, and I think that Babakis kind of addresses something. I don't see the Aurochs being able to survive off of the pines unless the pines are way more nutritious than a normal pine tree, which, I mean, magic, they could be. Yeah, they could be. Hmm, it's a good point. Yeah. Didn't someone say something about m moss or something? Yeah, frost moss. Frost moss. The the name's lacking a bit of luster, but yeah, uh, moss. But you can, can you can dry it. You can use it as something that's going to absorb stuff. You can use it in stews. Reindeer, dude. Reindeer dig in the ground and they dig up uh, lichen during the winter months. Oh. They'll dig up like little bits of lichen and consume lichen when they're out in herds. And there are people that have traveling. Oh my God. This is just, it's just building on itself. We could have 
we could have uh, the Aurochs be uh, uh, creatures that just naturally inhabited the area. Like uh -huh. this wouldn't be an imported species or anything like that. They just lived here. Um, they'd have really thick fur though. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, a warm blooded creature living in this kind of setting, you could just use Aurochs. Uh, yeah, I mean, I can ex expect reindeer being in the area, digging up lichen in the forests. Makes uh, sense. I know Shad how nutritionist is lichen. <laughs> Shadzar says, uh, what is this? Because live doesn't tell anything. If it wasn't live, it was a rerun showing as live. I would... <laughs> title needs work. I think our title still says Nerdarchy Live Chat. Oh, really? <laughs> I was trying to, but, to do streams on youtube facebook and twitch and only twitch stuck and the title just says live chat yeah we we went through an entire setup process before going live tonight uh and very few things we did worked correctly so yeah. i'm just glad uh, our heads faces bodies are where they are supposed to and can actually exactly see what's happening here we're on the screen and we made it onto one of the things we feel like that was that was very yeah that was very successful um yeah so yeah. to answer the question we are doing world building on a particular area of the world of Ulfgenia, which is a mega earth with two suns at the poles and so there is a strip of frozen area called kredgeford's belt and kredgeford is one of the deities of the world of charms of discordia the campaign setting for nerdarchy and mm -hmm. Uh, Ulfgenia is the world that that we're playing in, and Kretschmer's Belt is the frozen region we're talking about right now. Exactly, exactly. So we're we're flashing out a town in this this frozen belt, and we're coming up with, you know, beasts of burden. What do they eat? What are they trading? Why do they live there? The, it's it's a dwarf settled area, like a semi failed dwarven expedition essentially decided to set up shop there. Yeah. Uh, Seals and walruses, seal cuttlefish cuttlefish mixture. Well, it is D and D. <laughs> Why <laughs> yeah. not? Cuddle seal <laughs> pelt. That just makes me think of like a seal with like a mind flayer mouth. Oh. Yeah, aberration time. I like where I like where you're going. I'm picking up what you're putting down. <laughs> Nightmares. And I'm putting it down again. Cuddle seal pelts that change color. <laughs> Oh, D and D, you fill me with such joy. Cuddle seal. Uh, it's not what you think. <laughs> and yeah, it's not what you do. Not do not cuddle the seal. <laughs> You'll be so unhappy about that choice. Um, <laughs> doubling up on what Orange said, I'm wondering what the main two gods of the dwarves are. Right, right, right. So the religions in this area. What what do these people believe in? Because it right. would be predominantly dwarven. Yes, but in in Ofgenia, there's the the pantheon. There is the human deity of light and basically everything human that's good. There's elven deity of light and everything that's good about elf. And there's the dwarven deity of light and everything that's good about uh, dwarves. They're all the same deity, just worshipped in different facets. So the dwarves call him Grandar Sunforge. Hmm. So that is the the major goodly deity for the dwarves is Grandar Sunforge. He just happens to, he because he appears his avatar appears as the race that he speaks with, which is why he has many names. Clever fellow. Clever fellow. Oh well, yeah, you show up as an elf. <laughs> it doesn't matter how much you glow. I'm you not show up trying hammer. to get ulting, but we're not worshiping you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's not happening, lad. You can go away. We'll wait for the next deity to show up. Yeah. Leave us alone. We're chewing on the trees. <laughs> mm -mm -mm. Uh, yeah, it's it's a frozen desert town. Huge glass seas. Uh, inter okay, all right. So, uh, deities. We've got some weird that's beasts the, of that, So, that's the deity. That's the main deity. Because I, I think, what, Russell Mann's asking? Yes. Uh, uh, and then Crunchfur is the deity that's more about, you know, it's like a patron for, for rangers or huntsmen. More of the mm. bestial nature of nature. Mm. I like this. Yeah. Rather than, you know, happy, fluffy, 
fairy dancing in the woods kind of nature. Okay. Happy, fluffy. Yeah. <laughs> so There's think... an elf who'd like to talk to you. <laughs> What'd you call it? <laughs> What'd you call it? So think um, like Lord of the Hunt kind of mm-hmm. feel to him. He might actually, I think he is the world's Lord of the Hunt. If that gives you mm-hmm. an idea on, on what we're looking at for that. Okay. We have, uh, the, Babacus wants to know uh, about any kind of like, is there summer months lo- warm enough? And I think you were talking about this earlier where there's grass growing or anything like that. He was talking about the, the, these mammals that we have living, the, uh, giant steers essentially, mm-hmm. uh, they would need a place to warm up. They need a place to breed. They need a place to fatten up by feeding on vegetation. Um, so we can make the ultra nutritious ghost pine if you want. It does everything. It does uh, everything. I would say that they've, they've got to be some kind of, there's got to be something there that they can consume. And I, I think spring, summer, like a, a, a spring or fall kind of feel to it is mm-hmm. there. It's just, it's not as prevalent. It's not as obvious as something like, oh, there's snow on the ground. Oh, it's 90 degrees. You know, it's not, it doesn't do that. It's more like most places stay frozen. So Mm -hmm. pretty much the area is permafrost, but. Well, there are areas where the, the, because a lot of times when people try and picture tundra, eventually they picture like just an endless frozen flat waste, but sometimes there are like high ridges or mounds uh, where you can get some grass or vegetation growing on those slopes. Uh, so maybe the herdsmen have to take them up mountainsides or I, cause we, we haven't discussed if there's, I mean, is this area solid ice is there, uh, there has to be something there if there's these warm vents coming up. Yeah. Mm. This, in the area, that would be a good point that there would be herds traversing the area and consuming the, the warmed up, basically the stuff that's grown in the warmed up area in in yellowstone national park you have a really interesting thing happening basically there are these hot springs excuse me there are these hot springs and because of the hot springs vegetation is available there year round and the bison go and consume the vegetation next to these hot springs unfortunately the vegetation has a massive amount of chemicals on it from the hot springs so it's kind of semi-toxic uh But you could do a non-toxic version of that where there's just vegetation growing around these minor hot springs all over the place. Maybe herds would come there to consume um, a herd of walrus cows. (laughs) Walrus cows. That would be, that could be some kind of fauna there. Mm. Walruses. Uh, Raven thylacine. I'm not sure if I said your name correctly. Uh, Raven uh, w- just brings up uh, something I've always loved, uh, salt. Uh, and he's talking about the, the Romans used salt. It's where we get the term salary from. Oh, yeah. And wor- worth your salt, right? Right. And that could actually be a really cool angle to hit on. They do have the ocean relatively close to them. I mean, there, there is a bit of a travel, but they, they can get salt from there. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't be quite the same thing, but a salt mine in this kind of setting would be insanely valuable and they're dwarves. So mining the salts. Yeah. I can see that be, uh, you have seas that over time, the, the water gets frozen in certain areas. It gets really mm-hmm. briny and really rich salt mm-hmm. content. And then they, they harvest that area, dry it out and bam salt. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, the sea room gas mines. There's so many ideas right here. Uh, dead plankton washes up on the shore in massive quantities. Uh, you could have uh, seaweed. You could have all kinds of stuff. Yeah, maybe I was there has to be some kind of of plants growing in the in the water. Oh, so that could be something. I've got it. I've got it. I've got a great idea. You're gonna hate it, but all I'm right. gonna sell it to you anyway. Okay, this is my great idea. You guys, let me know what you think. What if Listening. their area? <laughs> he's already doesn't like it. There are these shallow pools, like uh, swampy shallow pools, 
that are all over the place that stay defrosted, like thawed out year round because of these uh, hot spring areas. And they're they're very tepid water. We're not talking about a full blown hot spring that you're going to go hop in in the well, day. Yeah, because every, everything's freezing it around. Right, but because of these warm, open, like plain like areas. <laughs> maybe just have a foot or two of seawater in them. There could be grasses growing in there or kelp like grasses growing in there that the, 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 these steer could come feed from. And it could be unique to the region or the area if we wanted, uh, but it could be like an interesting way to, to bring in more vegetation. It could also be really interesting for players to run into something out there. Like maybe that's where lizard men live. <laughs> and they could expand that concept once they see it in the wild, they could transplant some of them and make like farm, like tr troughs of this next to Wormston mm. and kind of farm it out. <clears throat> this, right. is, this plan is coming together perfectly. So a seaweed kind of like grown like rice. Yeah, exactly. Like, like a kelp or seaweed grown in a similar fashion to rice. And those of you who have never grown rice, essentially what you do is you flood a field you take little seedlings of rice, you stuff them into the dirt, and then once the rice is matured, uh, you pluck everything out, whip the hooey out of it, and yeah, there you go, you have rice. That was a really condensed version. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a, there's a part where you flood the area yes. to keep it from getting like eaten up and other things from the bugs mm. and stuff. Environmental hazards, geysers. Geysers is a great idea for an environmental hazard. Just, just ice. How many players do you know? I mean, I can just imagine the group of players setting out on their two day journey across the ice and no one is poking the ice with a stick as they walk and someone just 60 foot crevasse. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Skates down into a, a, Hey, Insta dungeon. Insta dungeon. Exactly. That's perfect. Uh, plant based whales, ice rice, uh, break through the ice to gather sunlight once each day. Um, yeah, exactly. And ice fishing does make a significant amount of sense. I imagine there would be quite a bit of that. I imagine an ice fisherman would be a pretty hardy fellow, though, given the kinds of stuff that lives under the ice. Yeah. I bring a harpoon and the fishing pole. <laughs> I use both. <laughs> yes. I'm ready. I'm ready. Mm. Yeah. Instead of the underdark, you have the under ice. You may have said that as a joke, but I love that idea. A large set of caverns carved beneath the ice. Yeah, it's, well, it's the dungeon. Exactly. I think this is brilliant. I think this is brilliant. This is a really good idea. Oh, ice worms. Uh, so it is fertile enough to grow. You just have to get sunlight to it. Yeah. It would be, it, that would be complicated. And I, for my personal direction in world building, I avoid uh, some of the more fantastical elements. Uh, when I was researching dwarves for an article I wrote on Nerdarchy, there was a, uh, one of the explanations for dwarves living underground and where they get food from was that they had the, you could see me shaking my head. I hated this idea. <laughs> they have these giant crystals that carry sunlight underground. And I just, it does not mesh with how I like to world build. So I was totally against it, but. Well, does it carry sunlight underground or do they have these long tubular chambers that they've polished? Well, they, they have a crystal see, at the end. Even that would have been a better explanation. They were essentially saying they had giant crystals had magic that would catch sunlight. Yeah. And shoot beams of plant growiness out the end. It just killed me. I couldn't get into it. I, I understand why you'd say that, <laughs> but. What was it? In the old Tolkien song, they've got, they talk about trapping lights and gems. Yeah. Yeah. But it's about putting magic into swords, not trapping light to re radiate it out. In that same article, I did do a small amount of trash talking to Tolkien dwarves. Cause I didn't, <laughs> I didn't like, I know. Well, well because, I, <clears throat> okay. I, I just started watching the Hobbit series, the Hobbit, the three movies again. I've, I'm on the third movie and I thought to myself, mm. Where in the heck are they getting all the stuff to live? Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly. That, be, that doesn't factor in to that stuff. These are mythical Ooh. creatures practically. So the Underdark has mind flares. Instead of mind flares in the Underdark, we will have the disturbing, what were those called? 
the squid mouth. <laughs> In the Underdark, it's not as... It's not what did he say? He wants to cuddle. <laughs> I don't think I want to. I'm good. Maybe I'm he's good. like a flump and he's just really nice. Nope, brain eater. <laughs> I'm not comfortable with this. I need an adult. Uh, the Mighty Hobbs and his wife suggests uh, snow that makes you fall asleep. I like the idea of kind of along those lines. I like the idea of a ice themed fae, especially since these woods apparently have been here since forever. I really like that. Well, I've oh, got, got snow some... elves that I did for a Patreon award one time. And they were, mm. they were these people they lived in the a fortress and basically they were they were augmented by a powerful mirror artifact so they have kind of these portents and ability to see things like augury style oh, so they're okay. like prophetic right. elves but they're very cold-hearted and they just also happen to live in cold regions so oh. they would they would be the kind that would they would have the ice castle made of ice in a forest so emotionally or thematic emotionally, I kind of get that. Yeah, and well, they're with, withdrawn. They're withdrawn from the world because, well, the youngins they go on this like, I don't know, burning fever kind of like excursion as the youth, like the rebel mm -hmm. youth go out and do things in the world, but as they get older, they kind of temper themselves and come back. And the reason they go out into the world is because they see some, they have some kind of vision, and they go on a quest for it. Mm. Because like they this. can, they have this kind of clairvoyance, augury ability naturally in their bodies. But mm. that's why they're reserved. Because otherwise, they'd be create. They get themselves killed trying to fix the world. Did you see chat? <laughs> <laughs> I fell him. Do you want to build a snowman? <laughs> no, I want to build a snow fort. Nice fortress. <laughs> Uh, being lit up with eerie blue glow from the bioluminescence. Oh, see, that's one of the things that was so romantic for me about, about envisioning the Underdark, especially, and I know saying this name, some of you, someone's going to throw something at their screen when I say this, but Driss Duerden, <laughs> when I, I know, when I first read about him, I was very young. And so was I. I yeah, and it, and when they talked about the Underdark, thinking of the bioluminescent things living on the walls and lighting up the area, mm -hmm. I mean, the next time I got to see something that romantic I'm, was probably Skyrim when I was running through Skyrim. a cave and I was like, oh, are those glowing mushrooms? Can I, ser they? Can I seriously harvest these? Awesome. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so uh, Inuit words for things. I like the idea of doing stuff like that, mixing that kind of stuff in. Absolutely. Evil snowman. <laughs> yeah, we, we have, we had a few ideas for uh, kind of elemental interactions with this kind of setting. Um, and, and mixing in the concept of, of uh, different real world cultures with fantasy cultures. I'm a huge fan of that. Many times you can ask yourself a question when you're world building and say, what would these people live like? And if you look, you'll realize also it gets you a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, research time into weird things like strange ways that other people have lived in the past or something like that. But another Drist fan girl. <laughs> I knew that was going to come. I knew somebody was going to face palm as soon as I said Drist. Hey, you said I, not Drist Dritz, whatever, was romantic. You said the bioluminescent stuff that lit up the darkness. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and for for Salvatore uh, books, I prefer the Cleric Quintet. That's my the, mm. my favorite stuff that he that wrote. That one's good. I, yeah. So that's I'm not a Dritz fan, girl. <laughs> uh, I, knew, I knew I was like, this isn't this isn't you can't say this world and not have someone jump you for it. Uh huh. It's true. Yeah. So I put for high hazards, we've got ice traps where just natural hazard of falling through ice, mm -hmm. which would be basically like a same, you'd save and throw just like a trap. And, and then perception or investigate to spot it. Regular blizzards. Yeah, blizzards. Uh, and then I was thinking someone said something about snowfall that makes you fall asleep. But if you had 
different things. I was thinking about the chemicals in the pools and stuff like that. If there was something that mm -hmm. kind of steamed out of them ever so often that then froze and like created some kind of snowfall that was nasty and maybe it like made you tired, oh. maybe it made you sick or poisoned. Dude. Okay. All right. So we should, we should, let's explore hazards here. Okay. Natural hazards, things, things in the world, magic or mundane that add interest and scariness to, you know, if you've got your group of players next to you and they're, they're on their two day trek through the ice, there's lots of normal things that could be scary, but like more interesting things, fantastical things that could really ruin your day. <laughs> I say this laughing. I'm not an evil GM. I'm nice to most <laughs> of my players. <laughs> How can I screw them tonight? <laughs> um, there, there's so much stuff going in. Uh, a roper that looks like an ice formation. Hmm. That's awesome. Uh, the poles. Oh, uh, Orange, in the beginning, we talked about the poles. And the poles of the planet, if that's what you're talking about, are deserts. Yes. So The frozen region, it's reversed. Basically, there's two suns, and the frozen region is the belt around the Earth. Hmm. Uh, hidden or forgotten city somewhere in the under ice, but to get to it is near impossible. I, I'm sure that there could be all kinds of stuff like that. Invisible creatures that uh, latch onto animals and PCs and sucks the warmth from their bodies. <gasps> That's kind of awesome. Like a really dark ice elemental. Yeah. Like a pygmy yeah. one. That's just like like a tick almost. Having snow, where if you don't have snowshoes, you just fall through. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, yeah, Ivelon, this is 5th uh, edition. 5th mm. edition homebrew. Mm, tasty. It, it, if you had just super fluffy snow, I mean, we don't even need to involve magic for some of these things. Razor ice. Razor ice could be created. Like imagine if there's, uh, we're all huddled in our tents and we're all hanging out and we're, we're, we've got a tiny little fire and we had to build the fire underneath like some kind of like lean to or something in order to uh, stay uh, away from the storm. And as the, as the storm gets really horrible, it generates razor ice. Like it actually whips up the snow uh, into some kind of like frozen razor sheets or something. Yeah, rather than rather than you uh, you know frozen rain, you you'd get the the maybe the sheets of ice, maybe the sheets of freezing rain that stick to the rock and then get peeled off. And yeah. Like fly through the air. Yeah. So the players wake up the next day and they're maybe they're all completely useless in a fight now because they're suffering from exhaustion, but they the get up the next all beat day. up. Yeah. Tents all beat up. And now they have to get through something even worse, which is fields and fields of razor. <laughs> oh yeah. Cause it'll be sticking out of the, be sticking out of snow and frozen. You just, <laughs> welcome to the place where the GM gets to ruin your life. Enjoy. Um, Oh God, uh, Mighty Hob hit it, uh, glacier calving. So when, if anybody doesn't know what glacier calving is, this is essentially when a glacier is moving forward off the landmass or mountain range or whatever it's in, as it's moving forward, large pieces like massive school bus or many school bus sized pieces of the glacier. Skyscraper will, size. Yeah, will fall off of the the glacier and smash into the water or onto the ground or whatever that that could be bad that could be that's a death it lands on you save versus death i don't know what to tell you like, <laughs> it, it weighs more tons than a jumbo jet and it landed on your head i don't care what level you are you're probably going to be dead they do have damage for a moon-sized monster's bite so <laughs> It's who, like 24 D 10 or something ridiculous. Who weighed that out? Who was like, I think I've got this guys. I think I know how much damage this is going to do. Yeah. Yeah. The, Needle rain. Yeah. Kind of like the same razor ice concept, I think. Yeah. 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 Living snow, <clears throat> like a blizzard, but it isn't snow. It is just called snow. Mm -hmm. It's really flesh eating insects that are pure white. Ugh. If you, uh -huh. 
<laughs> okay, one. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. We've got to stop for a little bit. I think I, I think I got sick. We want to be able to sleep tonight. If you guys can keep that. <laughs> oh, that sounds terrible. I like it. Uh, we'll include that in the hazard section. Yeah, let's let's do. That. And and there's there's so many concepts here. When you when I first started reading that description, like living snow, that kind of thing, I started to think of uh, the Mummy movie, where he. He uh, controls the sands and makes the sands like swallow an airship they're in. And oh, he like, yeah. yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, that could be really cool. Uh, skeletons in the living snow, grenade trees. Oh, did we explode again? I think we explode. Oh, no. Uh, is the stream okay? It buffered for a second for me. It doesn't say we're, we're, we're bad. So hopefully we're good on there. So. Okay, we're good. We're fine. We'll just pretend it's normal. A creature like a shambling mound, but made out of ice, snow, and rocks. Strem is fine. The strem, Babakis said the strem is fine. Mm. So apparently we can keep stremming. We're good. We're good. It's an orange immortal said it's God. So, <laughs> <laughs> mm. so I think that can fall under all types of ice elementals. Yeah, exactly. So we snow. can just... Ice elementals, clearly we can come up with a thousand uses. But you could absolutely uh, reskin a shambling mound and just Dude. describe it like that and have it do cold damage. Oh, yeah. All day long. We didn't even think about damage types. I, I mean, I guess the damage types are going to be pretty, pretty easy to come up with. Everything here is going to be cold or freezing or, you know, most of this stuff's going to be pretty simple. Unless you're Remoraz and then you're burning. Unless you're... <laughs> Yeah. Can a Remoraz, rem, Remora, I don't know. Can it, Remoraz, the, whatever you'd like to call it, the heated parts of its body, can that be like, can you like scoop those bits out and use them for stuff? Can you? Why not make some kind of harvesting magic? I mean, that, that. I'm just thinking of like, like practical uses for items in your area. There could be a dungeon that's filled with a hundred Remoraz under Wormston, and that's why it's warm. Oh yeah. It's just a Remoraz <laughs> colony that they just don't know yet. Just a bunch of caves. Yeah. Like an filled with these guys. Thing, and they just have no idea. Yeah. Uh it's been buffering you for you, but you have a storm. Okay, well let us know, guys. Tonight is the first night that we've done this. We struggled a little bit. Next time, hopefully, we'll be able to cater to YouTube and Facebook and Twitch all at the same time. Um, I don't know what happened tonight, but we do know things exploded, so hopefully we'll get it fixed for next time. Yeah. Dave uh, seems to okay. know what's what's up on his end when he does mm -hmm. it, so I'm just going to say, Dave, show me the way. Dave, teach me the way of doing the sweet multi-stream. Yes, so that we can show up at both places when I say I'm going to. Yes. <laughs> so, so we don't let anyone down. Yeah. Um, okay, we've got, what do we have? Ice traps, blizzards, razor ice, fields of razor ice after the storm, toxic snowfall, which is terrifying. Basically, this is like murder the player's land. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, there's, you can always stay in Wormston, and that's why there's actual mm -hmm. permanent permanent living quarters and residence there because yeah. the outside is so terrible that they barely made it to Wormston in the first place. So I kind of, I, and now, now that we've touched on that, I'm kind of wondering how, how are the hobgoblins getting along here? I mean, they, I, they could be, they could be tribal. A, nobody can live off of raiding despite what Hollywood might try and tell you. This Nobody can live off raiding all the time. You can't just raid settlements and survive. This is true. Um, they so actually, I guess they, I would say they have actually taken on a bit of duty and responsibility as well. So what one of the major things they do is uh, require tribute of people that are crossing the seas. Uh -huh. So they don't they don't just like oh we're gonna kill you and take your stuff. They they require that you give them something. So kind of a supplemental income kind of thing. Yeah, right? I mean they're traveling, they're patrolling, they're killing monsters, they're killing, they're killing other things that shouldn't be in the region. They're eating them. I like this idea. So they're they're heavy meat eater diet. 
they've got their seaweed farms, their mm. whatever grass that you're talking and, about. I mean, if they lived far enough away from the city, especially if they lived towards the coast, they could have vessels that they go out and like every time they know a ship's going to show up that's trying to get to this town, they could try and make pirate attacks against that or like yeah. that, you know, it brings up a lot of concepts like if there's trading lanes, like where vessels would regularly be traveling by. If there's anything like that going on in the ocean near the town, maybe the hobgoblins are doing something there. I know we're supposed to be on the town, and now I want to talk about hobgoblins. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> that's fine. We can we can flesh those out more first. That's fine. Oh, so just uh, require Russet, tribute. Russet man uh, just threw out a really neat idea. Uh, just the idea of <laughs> ice trolls. Uh, a, a huge bridge in between two semi-permanent glaciers. I mean, glaciers move slowly enough. If it was made of wood, it would make sense. It probably wouldn't make sense to make the bridge out of stone or something. It could get augmented it, if it was wood. Yeah. So if it, it maybe like a wood bridge that's just a temporary structure that gets rebuilt from time to time. I I can't remember how quickly glaciers move in a year. But I guess if you needed to get across the glacier to get to somewhere, you might build a bridge across it, a mm -hmm. wood bridge. Um, or maybe the bridge is on either side. The hobgoblins control both sides and they just, mm -hmm. it's an extension bridge that they just, they, you know, they would just oh, yeah. literally build extra pieces to interlock together. Just, just draw bridge kind of thing. Yeah, and you then could they do could that. Yeah. Take stuff apart. I mean, there are all kinds of examples of uh, like Mongol uh, pole houses where they just put up a bunch of poles and put a skin over it, and boom, you have a house. So maybe they have like kind of this mobile fortress thing going on with, with kind of tribal homes. Yeah, almost like siege towers. Yeah, exactly. You could have siege exactly. towers where that drop this drop the stuff. Oh, this is a good idea. This is a good idea. Um, holy macaroni. Uh, but most people don't see that because that's kind of deep in the territory. Mm, I would say yeah. for like you want to, whatever's going on with the hobgoblins, the interaction the PCs would normally have would be getting asked for tribute, fighting them, dealing with things they might have missed, like monsters they missed, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. This makes sense. A rope bridge <laughs> would move with the glacier, and then they just have to adjust the tension from time to time. That's a good has, point. Yeah, that's not a bad idea either. I was just thinking like stone would be fairly implausible for something like that. Also, stone bridge would be incredibly heavy and it is sitting on ice. No matter how permanent ice in a glacier looks, it is, you know, still just ice, compacted or not. Um, for your hobgoblins, living coconut things in Moana. Living, oh my God, are you talking about Living coconut things. Sure, it's Moana, or isn't it? I don't recall. I don't think I've seen it. There is, so there's this um, Disney movie about this girl helping this uh, defunct god. Uh, and in the movie, they travel really far. And during one of their voyages, they run into uh, these like coconut pirates. <laughs> It sounds ridiculous, but I promise if you have to watch a movie with your kids, watch it. It is amazing. The coconut pirates are incredibly cool. They're a great concept. Um, that's Moana. Okay, it is Moana. It is Moana. Gotcha. So Moana, go watch the show because, dude, the coconut pirates are so worth it. I'll, I'll have to check it out. Kakamora. Okay, mm -hmm. let's Google that and see if I can't find a good image. It sounded pretty cool. Moana, so if it's got coconut pirates, I'll have to check it out. <laughs> yeah, dude, it is. <laughs> you guys, thank you. It is the Kakamora. They are uh, amazing little coconut people. I absolutely, <laughs> they really are. Like the pirate scene is just incredible. The way they fight, like I, there has to be some kind of like frosty adaptation we can do. A coconut wouldn't work very well in an Arctic setting. But there has to be some kind of some kind of something we can do for that. That sounds like I'm gonna to have to watch it for inspiration and then kind of Dude, think cold yeah. thoughts. <laughs> think cold, think cold thoughts. thoughts. Think cold thoughts and think about the skiffs, the ice skiffs that go across like the frozen seas. Oh god, this is a good idea, guys. Uh, <laughs> they were based on Mad Max. Oh yeah, hey Chip Arzan, how's it going? Yeah, 
So those were based, the, the little uh, pirate ships were based on uh, Mad Max stuff. Shiny and chrome. So that could be that could be another amazing thing to put in. Yeah, those are those are fantastic. That will work really well. Uh, right, little voodoo pygmies. Best. <laughs> uh, orange. I think right now we're not gonna we're not gonna play around with chat and trying to do permits and anything like that. We haven't actually gone through. We have people that we're going to have be moderators, but we haven't gone through and settled those people up yet. Yes, exactly. Uh, now, I wanted to make sure we got everything we had for the hobgoblins. So, right, got fire, uh, fire, fire. Oh, we got the yeah. <laughs> bladed steering, the ore hooks. They require tribute. <clears throat> they have a bit of farming uh, happening, um, but they basically, rather than raiding Viking style, that it's more like it's more of a like, hey. You know, we, we, we tame this area so that you mm. don't get just killed by everything in it. So you owe, exactly. a, you owe us something for that. Mm -hmm. A sense of entitlement. The hobgoblins have a sense of entitlement. Yeah. Absolutely. And well-deserved as well. Right. Right. Absolutely. It, so if they if they feel that way, then they would essentially like lay claim to a certain amount of territory, right? Yeah. They try and they try and control all the sea, all the seas of the region. Mm. So if you're traveling a long enough okay. distance and you're going past the ghost pines and and heading on to the, the sea area, which is very – it's delineated because it goes from hilly, icy areas to a flatter area with little mm -hmm. islands that, mm. you know, it's it's all frozen over. So, But you can still tell the, the, the islands. So I like. I like. Uh the booby traps on their hunting grounds to claim them oh yeah yeah bob kiss was talking about like leaving traps and other gnarly things in their wake to keep other people out of their hunting territory and stuff like that that's not a bad idea and there is there is precedent for that kind of thing like historically where tribes would leave bad things around especially like tiger traps and stuff not the atypical hole in the ground tiger trap you might be thinking of, but like crazy sapling tree bent around a huge oak with just a big spike sticking out kind of stuff. So, um, yeah. So, so nasty maybe little things that are going to ruin your day. <laughs> yeah. Why? Why is it? We've just concentrated on murdering the party. We haven't accomplished. <laughs> well, hey, it's it's uh it's like man man versus nature. Nature, exactly. nature would win without without the place that they're holed up in. Exactly. Uh, oh, so <laughs> heading back to the residence, I guess the, okay. the look of the place. Oh yeah, appearance. Yeah. And there and there are tons of good questions about appearance uh, uh, because building materials. Um, so are they are their dwarves or did most of the the bulk of the construction? Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's going to be stone and wood. Right. Uh, roofing is, yeah, exactly, orange architecture. Uh, roofing, they could see th my, my thoughts on roofing. This is where my thoughts on roofing go. Snow is heavy when there's lots of it on your roof. Mm -hmm. So what do they build the roof out of that can deal with that? It's probably just really fortified. And like just, I would say earth bermed. It's probably earth burned. What about stone arches? Yeah, let's go with that. You could do stone arches with like the earth. Uh, does anybody remember what the name of the, the Vikings would take chunks of sod and they would stack them like bricks and build these kind of earthen homes out of them? I just cannot remember the name of what that's called. They could do something like that too, essentially like permafrost earth that they used. And then it's, it's the homes you always see the pictures where there's like grass literally growing on the walls yeah. of the home. Yeah. So the sod uh, blocks. Ooh. Carved ice. I'm upset <laughs> you thought of that before me. <laughs> That's, but I, that is a really good uh, they would definitely do that kind of stuff for for mm -hmm. uh when they travel someplace and they they need like a a way station for rangers or something. I could see that being made uh -huh. out of ice. Yes, but I would, I would think idea. that the major permanent structure is going to be wood and stone. I would, you know, metal bracing, uh, some metallic bracing would work. 
uh, they make beams out of ice and fortify them with sawdust, and that helps them not melt. I did not know that. I'm so glad I do. Grass blades, sawdust, and ice. Yeah, it's Ca- not a bad idea. Casting, casting some beams. Yeah, very cool. Very cool. Uh, okay, this is fair. Kubrick said, uh, how much snow are we talking here? If it's a ton of snow, carved ice would be the most ready source uh, or made from animal bone. Uh, stone would be harder to get mm-hmm. due to the depth of the snow and the frost. Hmm. Well, the nice thing ice. about worms, warm stone mm-hmm. is that the area is kind of cleared of ice. So... Mm snow melt happens there as well as it's not the ice is not as thick at that point because mm. it's constantly been melted so while right. <clears throat> while you normally have just a hill of you know the ice the ice basically thickens as you get away from from warmston but you've got that kind of hilly area that they've mined into and set down like these these stone bermed earth bermed houses Okay. All right. That's what I'm going for. I'm, I dig it. I totally dig it. Uh, looks like uh, Babakis looked it up. It's Icelandic turf houses, and apparently it, it literally is called a turf house. A turf house. <laughs> Who would have thought? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, uh, Antarctica is a deader, desert, so maybe not that much snow. Like Greenland, where grass grows in the summer, then a lot of snow. That's true. You need a source of moisture if you're not generating those uh, like evaporation off the oceans or something like that from heat. God, weather systems in your planet are going to be Oh, yeah, all screwed up. Yeah, it's all screwed up. Okay, can we mentally imagine what the weather system would be like? We have two deserts on either end that are incredibly hot. Mm -hmm. If they're deserts, it doesn't rain there. For so, the most part, yeah. Right. So they very little rainfall. Yeah. Um, if we have deserts and it doesn't rain there, then we have a band right next. Like if this is the top of the planet and then we go down some, the band around it is going to be exposed to incredible amounts of heat. Yeah. Uh, so that's where a bunch of evaporation is going to take place. As we move down towards the ring, there would be less evaporation because it's going to get colder again. Um, I think you so might be you doing could a have... little too much. That I... <laughs> yeah, I'm, just, I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying to envision how we're ending up, where we're ending up. Magic. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is how this goes. Now you guys know this magic. Magic, sirs and ladies. Mm-hmm. Uh. Strong source storms is the hot air the desert mixes with the cold air from the equator. Mm. Yeah, so you'll, that's yeah. like there'll be a tropical ring probably around the northern and southernmost points of the of the of the world. Dude, this but then, is but then crazy. based you're gonna have sea currents. You're gonna have sea currents, all different kinds of going different ways based on them churning against the the. the you're gonna have conveyor belts just like you know Earth does of water. You know, mm-hmm. less salty water getting taken away, sinking, getting carried away, and then the warm water getting pushed away from the really hot ends. Hmm. I'm just trying to imagine weather. I know I'm doing more science than I'm supposed to here. Uh, We don't have (laughs) enough land mass. There's all these things that just aren't there, aren't present for, for what's required to do weather systems. Besides say, hey, it's a snowy area. I bet there's blizzards here. (laughs) <laughs> uh kuvarik was saying the the two deserts uh i would expect winds and rapid melting and freezing causing fog wind storms and whiteouts yeah there's gotta be there's gotta be crazy weather well, those there. deserts are so far the 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 poles are so far away from kretschfer's belt mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that there's all these other places that get affected by that before it would even get close to being the yeah. So that's is, that's all kinds of. This is like inside <laughs> baseball geology talk. I that, warned you. I totally warned I'm you. I'm saying I like doing that, but at the same time, there's so little of the developed world that we have 
yeah. that I felt like this was like a, a landmark in the sense of it was unique to the world, Elfgenia. Mm-hmm. It's it's different than Earth. So it has yeah. it has that differentiation. And then how we're dealing with that and how the fantasy world deals with that differentiation is basically the why this I felt like was an easy first go for the um, for the world building. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Cold area, the bunch of food might keep for longer. Mm, yeah, as well as parts of harvesting creatures. There's just you guys just have so many good ideas. We could just sit here and look at good ideas. Can we just copy stuff down? <laughs> <laughs> just take notes. Take notes. Go quicker. No. Um, <laughs> um, what do we have? What do we? What did we actually get through tonight? We're almost out of time. What did we oh, get? Oh yeah, through? we're we're running on the last like ten minutes or so. All right, so we talked about the dwarves, how they settled there, how they found it, the nomadic tribes that also hung out with them uh, during the area. That's how they found Wormston. They settled Wormston because they're not used to the nomadic wilderness in the terrible desert life of the frozen area of Crusher's Belt. Then we've mm-hmm. got the trade goods they deal with. They've got the ghost pine forest as a major source of their food and animals and other things. Right. Um, the thermal vents keep that area warm enough for habitation even in the coldest months. We've got a There's... lot of different creatures in the area, including the <laughs> hobgoblins that sail on the barge seas. Well, yes. like, you know, sledding on, on the frozen seas. Uh, and they've got their interest in tribute as well as, you know, farming supplemented with the trade goods as well as the things that they get from people. So they, they, it's a stiff tax, but there's terrible things that live in the north that the hobgoblins deal with. So it's kind of like mm-hmm. a give and take. They've decided to undertake this and they're not volu- they're not asking for voluntary payment. They're asking for what's, <laughs> what's due them by right of their actions. Right. You walk through my land, you pay the toll. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you would have just been, you know, a month later, your spined horror feces someplace. You're not, you're not, <laughs> exactly. you're not a merchant that made it to the place across the, across the frozen seas and came back. I know what's over that hill. You can hear it howling. It will kill you, or you can pay me. And my boys will take care of it for you. Yeah. Choice. We've got some interesting creatures like the spined horror that has tremor sense and punches through the snow. I mean, the, the icy seas to attack things. We've got snow jellies, which anchor to oh, yeah. different parts of the ice. And to, and, and they also have their, ten, their tentacles going into the, the waters to grab smaller prey. There's plenty of fish in the sea, frozen seas and other things, so there's ice fishing going on. We've got the cuddle seal. Um, <laughs> it's not what you think, <laughs> which is like the Cthulian horror version of a seal and a cuttlefish together. God. <laughs> I'm uh, just super not. I'm never going for a swim there. Come on, join me in the hot spring. Yeah. No, Polar Bear I don't Club do doesn't have a lot of members. <laughs> They don't. Yeah. They don't last. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's regular no. <laughs> there's regular fauna and flora, uh, like bears, rabbits, foxes. But for the flora, we've got moss and lichen, some seaweed mm. that grows kind of like same has the same kind of growth cycle as rice. Mm. We've got the yeah. aurochs, the reindeer, walruses. Uh, we've got the mushroom stone bread that's used mm-hmm. and stored for, for hard winters. And we've got the ghost pine tree, which is kind of the major backbone of the economy in the region. It's a trade good, it's full, It's fuel. It can be alchemically turned into some kind of heating heating and lighting stuff. Um, you use it, they use it in brews and flavor things, and they mm-hmm. use it for glues, all kinds of stuff, all kinds of stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, the residents, mostly hill dwarves, bit of humans that have been adopted into the main clan. There's families within the clan, but then there's an overarching like the clan of Wormston, which right, is an amalgamation right. of everybody that survived the trek up to up to where they've decided to stay. Founding of the town. Yeah, the, the found- founding of the town. Yeah. So all the, all the dwarves banded together and created a, a, new, a new home. They've got the nomadic tribes that returned during the coldest months and there's like a, a difficult piece because everyone's kind of rougher and tougher in this region because you have to be to survive. Well, you so, got to fight to scratch out any kind of meaningful, just to fill your belly. I mean, it's you could literally be fighting to the death for food. Yeah, and those nomads most likely go after reindeer herds and auric herds and like <laughs> subsistence living, that kind of thing. Did you write down? <laughs> I'm going to be laughing about it all night. The penguin. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) 
Yes, <laughs> down here we've got the penguin Aracrocra. And Kuvaric feels very strongly that the cuttlefish should have camouflage, or, or the yes. the the seal cuttlefish should have camouflage. So, all right. <laughs> so disturbing. Well, uh, I'll put a note in. <laughs> <laughs> Make the seal cuttlefish even more difficult to deal with, and let them cloak like the predator. This is good. <laughs> uh, weapons. Hockey sticks with spiked pucks. Ah, oh, that's too. That's too Batman. What was that horrible freeze? What was it? Which which Batman movie was that? Oh God! I can't. Um, I can't devolve into. Uh... The one with <laughs> Sorry, Arnie. I can't remember. Cool off. Stick around. <laughs> he always has those lines. Yeah, classic uh, Batman villain. I knew the like nineteen fifty style. Yeah. He knows the reactor is made of topinium. Yeah. Anyway, um, I miss the creation bar. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, evil DM at heart. And you're thinking of Batman. <laughs> yeah, that's, I can't remember what the name of that Batman and Robin movie was. It was like, phew, went right through. Um, get to the chopper. Yeah. <laughs> get down. I do. I will say this goes with what Russ and Man is saying. A few, a few things. If you guys can think of anything that you feel like we've missed, uh, we have six minutes left. So hit us with any more ideas you might have. Maybe we take some notes right before we get done. Um, I will say the last thing I feel like we missed and didn't talk about is I, I have a love for the idea of weapons and shields and armor made of ice that never melts. I think that could be incredibly cool. I have no idea if that has play in any of this, but that's that's a theme that's been rattling around in my head the whole time we've been talking. Magic so, ice. Yeah, magic ice. And that's that's just something I'm going to throw in. Uh, you guys can, you know, maybe you guys think that's idiotic. I don't know. I but think you, with, any, with frost giants, anything is possible. Right. Right. Exactly. Boat anchor. Idea for a boat anchor that is a heated ball that melts into the ice and then freezes in place. Hob, you're on a roll tonight. That is not a bad idea. What if you used, what if the hobgoblins are like, yeah, we have these boat anchors. It's primarily iron, but we pour some Ramirez, Ramirez goo into the ball and then throw it off the, uh, throw it off the boat oh, yeah. and it just melts in. I forgot about the Ramirez goo. Yeah, exactly. Ramirez. Uh, war sled towed by Shaggy Kangaram. Kangaram. <laughs> is that is that a Star Wars reference? So no, no. Kangaram <laughs> is is one of our fantastical beasts. Oh, from our, from our product. That's, I thought he was. I think he was talking about like a tauntaun. Tom -tom. It, it kind of reminds me of one of those, but it's yeah. not. It's not. It's not similar enough. But it's. It also has some. If you had to pick a creature, a fantasy creature, I guess you could pick that one as it's close runner up to the kangaroo. Exactly. Yeah, those things are fun. <laughs> That's there you go, and reusing your your custom kangaroo, a shiny, uh, shaggy custom kangaroo could be really cool. Um, small mammals, squirrels, snow rabbits, actually made of snow. We kind of we kind of already touched on the like frost elemental stuff already. So. Yeah, I think that's going to fall into ice elemental creature type. Mm -hmm. That can be found in like the deep heart of the the Kredgefors belt. I agree, and and you could hit on so many things. You could literally be like, these are the basic design characteristics. Like here's the general gist of it, and you just add whatever the other creature is. So if you want a frozen eagle because you're GMing and you're using this location, add the eagle stats to the frozen stats, and there you go. There's your creature. Yeah, just have. I would say you could have it do ice damage. You could have it, maybe have a particular thing uh, like it's resistant or immune to ice. I'm Higher cold. armor class. It may unless, have a higher armor class. Unless it's slow. It's tough to hit because it's hard, but it's slower. So the armor class, yeah, I don't you know. you can kind of give a, a give and take for the features of the creature. Creature mm -hmm. features. <clears throat> Got to try to <laughs> capture this rimmer as uses. So Capture it. Capture it. So I'm still reading comments. Uh, bladed boomerangs or axes thrown and bounced off the ice. Uh, <laughs> 
Bobakis just wants the under ice fleshed out now that we have. It's got <laughs> oh, a whole I think we can do that in three minutes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> out an area of similar complexity and depth to uh, the, the uh, Underdark in Forgotten Realms. We're going to do something exactly the same, except it'll be the under ice. Um, the dwarves burn bits of coal in their beards to keep warm. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they have instead of the horned helmet, they've got like the beer beer mm -hmm. keg helmet, but instead it's like coal pieces and <laughs> that could be kind of cool. You just see dwarves walking around smoke pouring off their heads. Yeah, just like yeah. like stacks. Yeah. Like it looks like <laughs> coal stacks. Really fantastical elements. Uh let's see here. Bunch of stuff that does constitution damage and steals your warmth. Uh, Wendigos. Wendigos are scary. Wendigos are a crazy legend. They're they are scary. Um, that could be a nice niche addition. That would be that would be another creature that would be in the the region. I think that's is that in fifth five e. I know that's in previous editions. Let's find out. <laughs> well, it could it might be in Tomahar. I mean, uh, you know, what is it? Uh, Volo's Guide or other things? Yeah, I don't know it. The Wendigo, I definitely have used Wendigos in games. I know that back when D and D used a giant mega binder to hold all the creatures together for AD and D Second Ed, uh, Wendigo is absolutely in there. Right. Um, I don't think. I don't think well, there is a Wendigo. <laughs> well, while you're looking at that, um, I think it's time to wrap it up. So oh. sorry for anybody who tried to check this out on Facebook or YouTube. Uh, I have had some technical difficulties. I kind of tried to... Oh, Yeti. Yeti. yeti, yeti, yeti. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. Yes. Sorry. So I had some technical difficulties. This is on Twitch currently. But if you'd like to leave comments, we're going to have this be transferred over to YouTube. I don't know how long that takes, but it might take a couple hours or it might take a day. I have no idea. I haven't done it before, a Twitch YouTube transfer. But that's going to be the solution for this. So if you're interested in leaving extra comments or you think of something later, just drop it in uh, the comments over on YouTube. And uh, while you're at it, you can check out some of the serious amounts of buttons that Kanata helped me make uh, or made, and I've just added them in uh, for our Nerdarchy store. We've got... Um, group effort. Group yeah, group effort. Group effort. Uh, Nerdarchy store, we've got the website, we've got Patreon, basically. If you'd like seeing this type of content and you want to do something to us to assist it continuing continuing on into the future uh check those things out for us every little bit helps and uh don't forget to like share subscribe, subscribe for the people who aren't on twitch <laughs> later on <laughs> and until next time stay nerdy stay nerdy